and we started a new topic on I.O. systems, file systems, device drivers, and so on. That's the, as I mentioned, the third main component of the class. The last one is distributed systems. So last time I gave a very quick overview of uh, uh, the components layering in the kernel. And I mentioned that at the lowest level you have hardware. Device drivers are the pieces of the kernel that interface with the hardware. Every hardware device needs its own device driver. We will go back and look at device drivers in a little bit. Uh, for now, what we are going to do is take the disk as an example of an I.O. device. Okay, it's one of the more important devices on your machine because that's where all the data is stored. And look at disks in more detail. And I said, uh, as far as the layering goes, there are pieces of the kernel that interface with the device driver. For disks, that piece is the file system. Okay, and that's what we started talking about. You all know what files are. Okay, so we are going to look at uh, a formal definition of files and then we are going to try to understand how disks uh, organize data on uh, the storage medium, how files are created and so on. Okay, so this is a definition here of what a file is. It is essentially a logical unit of storage on a storage device. Another definition is it's a named collection of related information. Okay, so two key things. One is the files have names. Users who create the files give these names. Okay, and the reason is uh, for you to go back and access that piece of data again. Okay, internally the names don't mean anything to the operating system. Internally files are actually numbered. Okay, I'll show you examples. So a, a file essentially has a unique ID or a number and that's how the OS is going to access files. Okay? And there is a mapping that maps the name of the file to its file ID which is the number. And the table that actually creates that mapping is your directory. Okay? Your directories are essentially tables that map file names to the unique IDs by which the OS, or OS uh, recognizes files. Okay, here have some examples. You may have uh, lab1.java, you could have machine code. The extensions of files typically indicate the file type. Okay, that's not a hard and fast tool. It depends on the operating system. Okay, files we'll assume contain any data. Okay, it could be source code, binary data, any other kind of data. Okay, and files may can be structured or unstructured. Okay, in the Unix world, files are unstructured. What that means is Essentially, from a Unix perspective, a file is a sequence of bytes. Okay? The OS doesn't interpret the bytes. Okay? It's just bytes. It doesn't matter what is stored in the file. Okay? There are other operating systems that actually impose a structure on files. Okay? Mainframe operating systems are a good example. Each file is a collection of records. Each record has fields in it. Okay? This is what was created for early versions of databases, for instance. Okay? And this is handled natively, the record structure is handled natively by the file system. Okay? Now today we have databases that also organize data in form of records. If you know anything about databases, you should know about tables and tables are collections of records. Each record has certain fields in it. Okay? But as far as the file system is concerned, if it's a Unix file system and it's a database file, it just treats the file as a collection of bytes. It doesn't impose a structure. The structure is imposed by the operating system, not by the file system itself. But there are file systems that will actually impose this uh, structure and that allows you to do more interesting I.O. operations as we will see in a little bit. Okay? Files have many attributes. I already mentioned the name. There could be type. You can have location, which is what disk it is stored on, the size of the file, protection information, which indicates who can read, write, or execute files, time of creation, and so on and so forth. Okay, lots of fields that are stored. Okay. The thing that we will try to distinguish between is attributes of the file and data inside the file. Okay. These attributes are referred to as metadata. Okay. Metadata is essentially data about the data. Okay. So this is all of the information for the file which contains data. Okay. So this these fields are referred to metadata, and then the file itself actually is a container of data. Okay, with that, I mean, very brief introduction to files. Let's look at file operations. So, uh, these are some operations you can perform on files and or directories. Okay. Now, these happen to be system calls. Okay. 
So when you write application level programs, let's say in Java or C, you don't program at the system call level. So you may use IO stream or some other class to access files or in C, you may use the C library, which is file open and file print and those kinds of methods. Okay? What the library does is it, it then translates those methods to system calls that actually allow you to read and write files. And this is the interface that is actually supplied by the operating system. This is a Unix interface. There are similar interfaces in Windows. Okay? And the, the names of the methods should tell you what that method does. Okay? So create allows you to create a new file. Okay? Delete allows you to delete a file. Open opens a file, close, read, write. Seek allows you to move the file pointer to a particular location of the file. Okay? So these are low level operations. And then there are operations. So that's operation on the data. These are operations on the metadata. Okay? You can do get attribute and set attribute to look at the owner of the file and the permissions on the files and so on. Okay? We'll talk about hard links and soft links in just a few slides as well. Okay? So those are key uh, file system operations and here are the uh, data structures that the kernel maintains to enable all this file operation. Okay, there are two important data structures. One is a global data structure of all the files that are open by any process that are that's currently active. Okay? So this is the open file table. So it basically tell, is a list of every file that is open by any, uh, any process in your system at this point in time. So it will basically, uh, for each file that's open, it will have an open count. It tells you how many processes are accessing it. A file can be accessed by more than one process. It doesn't mean only one process has to access it. And then there are attributes. There's locations of the file on disk. We'll look at this, this particular aspect of the data structure in just a moment. And if the file is cached in memory, there are pointers to where it is cached. Okay, we'll talk about OS buffer caches and so on in a couple of lectures and that this is basically the pointer to cache versions of the file in memory. So in addition to this global data structure, every process has its own file table. Okay? So the file table for a process tells you what files are open by that process at this point in time. Okay? Same, way, same kind of information. In fact, the, uh, each of the entry here is a pointer to a global entry. Okay? And then there are some other attributes that are also stored. Okay, a global table per process table. So you can ask why do you need two? Why don't you just have one? Either have a date file table for every process or have a global table. Yes. So you assume that a process that is touching one is open to lots of process in Okay, so caching information. You got something to add? Uh, each process could be modifying a different part of the fire file, which is why they each need their own offset. Okay. So we went and identified at least one attribute of the file that is unique to a process. Okay. That is the file offset. Okay. Different files, I mean different processes may be accessing the same file, but they may be accessing different parts of the file. The file offset is a per process state that says which part of the file is this process currently accessing. At least that information is a per process attribute. So even if you, everything else is shared, this attribute will be unique to a process and you will have to keep track of it for each process. And that's effectively what is being done here. Okay? The other point that's related is some uh, processes may be reading to a file and some processes may be writing to the file. So some process may have opened the file in read mode, others in write mode. That information is also stored in the per process table. And some may have opened it in read write mode, which allows you to do both. Okay. Now, typically when you are uh, accessing the file using libraries, you may not even need to specify read mode or read write mode, but at a system call level, when you open a file, you have to specify what mode are you opening it. You only want to read data, only write data or both. Okay, so that's basically the information you store here. Okay. So you do need two data structures because some information that's common is going to be kept here. Some information that's unique to a process is kept in a per process table. Is that clear? Okay, so now we'll go through quickly a few file operations just to see 
these are this is think of it as pseudo code that shows you how to implement system calls okay the first one is how to create a file that's the create system call okay in unix so it basically essentially takes one argument which is the name of the file okay so much of it is just basically just checking whether you can create the file okay so first is you create first you check if you want to create a new file is there space on the parti this partition or in the file system if you are basically out of space you are going to return an error saying that you cannot create this file there is no space left on the device the other thing you are going to check are file permissions do you have permissions to create a file in the directory in which it is being created okay the directory is owned by some other user or by the super user and you don't have the right privileges again that call is going to fail okay so you are going to check for is there enough disk space do you have the right permissions so on and so forth okay and assuming that you don't have any error conditions to be thrown then you are going to go and actually create a new file descriptor okay a file descriptor is an entry in the file table so you create a new entry okay that will include the name okay that's the name that was supplied location on disk which is essentially the directory the entire directory name okay and other attributes are you opening it in read board and so on so so that's basically what you'll put in the file table you may keep optional attributes such as file type okay so certain file systems will track the type of the file saying that's an executable file or it's a microsoft word document or a powerpoint document or java source code all of that is tracked either using an extension or some extra information you store in the file system okay so all of this is created stored in the entry okay and then at that point the file has been created and you are ready to perform some read or write operations <coughs> okay so there is right so there are some advantages and disadvantages about here creating attributes but before i go into that let me pause here and ask if there are any questions okay fairly straight forward implementation of the system call do some error checks if it's okay to create the file cre create a new entry in the file table file descriptor the table and then populate it with the owner of the file and the name of the file and so on okay so if there are no questions let's ask this uh, uh uh look at this issue of what are the pros and cons of having the file system recognize file types okay. why should the os so there are two philosophies if you look at file system implementation there is the unix philosophy which says file is a collection of bytes you don't interpret what's in the file you don't know about the type of the file it for you it's just a opaque collection of bytes okay you don't give it any meaning whether it's source code machine code certain document type you don't care it's just bytes okay, or data that you store the other philosophy is the file system actually knows about the file type it knows what type of file it is what is stored in there Right? that requires the file system to keep extra information okay so really the question we are asking is what are the pros and cons of these two <coughs> approaches what could you do at the os level or the file system level if you knew the type of the file okay you could optimize it in what way would you try to use this to your advantage like cpu usage is higher okay so you could try to decide how to use it any other idea so yeah. just running the file you can feed it to another file so that like another program so as input for running so you could feed it to another program and you are saying you couldn't do it if you didn't know the file type right everything would basically be an executable of its own okay so you could use the file type to decide which applications to associate them sir okay so here's a very simple thing you could do okay let's say you go to your desktop and you double click on a file okay if the file system knew what type of file it was it will associate it with the right application and start the application automatically okay 
you probably all have done this. You go onto your desktop and double clicked on a file and maybe if it's a Word document, Word starts up. Right? You didn't ask how did the OS know what application to use for that file. Okay, if it's a PowerPoint file, magically PowerPoint starts up. If it's a Java file, an editor starts up. How does the OS know? Okay. Only way it can know is if you actually store the type of the file in the file system. Okay, and say it's a Word document and then there's some information saying all Word documents are opened using Microsoft Word. All PowerPoint files are opened. So you associate an application with the type of a file. So when you double click, the OS knows which application to start automatically. Okay. This is the simplest thing. There are many other advantages, but this is one simple thing you can do if you need a file type. Okay. Unix, on the other hand, okay, Unix for, uh, file systems don't keep this information in the file system. Okay. So if you say open this file, it, the OS won't know what application to use. So in Unix, what you would have to do is start the application and then from inside the application, you open the file. Because the OS doesn't know how to associate a file type with an application. Okay, is that clear? It's just one example of what you would do if you knew the type of the file. If you just assume that the file was data which and you didn't know what type of data, you couldn't possibly figure this out. Okay. Disadvantage of keeping file types is that now the OS and the file system are a little more complex because for every possible type of a file, you need to know what to do. If it's a JPEG file, what do you do? Okay, what application are you going to associate it with? HTML, what do you do? So for every type of file, you need to keep track of possible applications that you could use to access the file. Should the user simply click on the file and say open it. Okay. That makes it a little more complicated. Unix opt for simplicity. It says the user knows what type of file it is. So rather than having the user click on the file and opening the application automatically, we'll reverse it. Let the user open the application and then access the file, I mean go to a menu and then try to open the file from the menu for instance. Okay. So Unix philosophy is that this is all the user's problem, not the OS's problem, let the user figure it out. Okay. Now other operating systems like uh, Windows and uh, Mac OS X opt for keeping all of this information at the OS level somewhere. Is that clear? So now if you have used Linux, I don't know how many of you have, you probably will realize that even though at the OS level, right, Unix file systems or Linux file systems don't store file types, you can still, okay, if you are running some GUI app uh, on top of uh, Linux, let's say KDE or no, if you double click on a file, okay, it does open some application to access. Okay, if you use Linux at all, you will know this. So you should ask the question if the file system doesn't actually know the type of the file, how is Unix, how are Unix like operating systems still able to provide the same functionality that let's say OS X or Windows provide. The question clear? Yeah. Is the file extension Okay, file extension is associated with the file that somebody else had a hand on. Yeah. Uh, the GUI is providing that extra layer of abstraction. Okay, so both of these are true. So if you don't store this information in the file system and yet you want to provide your users with the same convenience, you have to track that information but it's not in the file system, it's somewhere else. Okay, in this case the GUI is the one actually figuring this out. Okay, and the way it does is exactly what was mentioned, for every file type, file extension, there's an application that is associated with it, but that table is actually now handled by the GUI. Okay, so when you double click, you don't actually send that to the OS and say, okay, start whatever application is associated with the file type. The GUI is going to say the user clicked on this file. This file has this extension, maybe it's dot .html or dot uh, .ppt and says, what should we do for this extension? And then say, you look up the table and say, start this application and then you go start it. So the point is, what Unix has done is you don't do this at the OS uh, level, okay? but yet you can do it by doing it at the application level or at user, user in this case at the GUI level. Okay? 
Okay, so you can implement the same functions not in the OS or in the file system but outside and still provide that convenience. Okay, so you can think about pros and cons. Okay, we won't belabor the point here. Okay, next uh, system call is delete. Very straightforward. It just allows asks you to delete a file. Okay, so you do the usual error checks. Make sure you have the right permissions to delete files. If you are a user and you are trying to delete some system level files to which you don't have permissions, you shouldn't allow all of that. Okay, once you are done that, you are done the error checks, you are simply going to go and actually delete the blocks of the file okay, and re release those blocks back to the file system and release remove the file descript of the entry for this file in the directory. Okay, so then the file is gone. Okay, we'll talk about ref counts and hard links in a moment. I will introduce that. There are some extra things you have to do when you do delete. Okay, so delete is very straightforward. Here are two more system calls. One is open, one is close. Okay, so these are open a file for reading or writing, and the close closes a file. Okay, again, fairly straightforward. So open is essentially doing similar things to create, except that the file descriptor has already been allocated. So the file exists. In create, you have to create a file and then you open it. In open, the create part of the process is already done. So you simply go and read the descriptor from the directory. And then you are going to create an entry in the global table. Okay, if the file is not already open, it's already open, there's nothing to do, you just create another entry in the process table and you are done. You do have to initialize the file pointer to the beginning of the file. When you open a file for this process, you start reading from the beginning. So you will basically initialize the file offset to byte 0 and you are done. Okay, so open is straightforward and close is even more simple, it's basically the opposite. You remove the entry from the process table, okay. You decrement the number of the open count in the system-wide table and if that goes to zero, that says no other process has this file open. So then you deallocate the system-wide table entry as well. Okay, so the per process entry is taken out. You decrement the count in the system-wide table. Okay, if there are no other processes accessing it, then you remove it. If some other process still has it open, you leave the global entry alone because the other process needs it. Okay, so very straightforward things to do. Okay, read and write. So once you have created a file or opened it, then you can actually do I/O on it. So reads and writes are basically shown here. Okay, there are a few arguments here. So uh, you provide a file descriptor. Okay, you say size, how much uh, data do you want to read or write, and then you give a buffer. Okay, this is the typical argument to read and write call. Okay, the file descriptor says what file are you reading or writing. When you do an open, okay, you will see that open returns a file descriptor. Okay, the file descriptor is the handle you are going to use subsequently. It's like a file pointer you are going to use to uh, read or write. So you supply the descriptor, say you how many of our bytes you want to read okay, and then you give a buffer of that size. You want to write, you will populate a buffer and say go write this out. Okay, and all that you are doing here is the OS is simply copying the data from the buffer and then it is going to hand it over to the device driver, saying go read it or write it or do or something to this. Okay, and how this happens we are going to look at. Okay, this is not the full implementation. This is simply showing you have copied it to a file but internally you have to go to the device driver and to actually do IO. All of that has been abstracted out here. That's handled by the device driver, not by the file system. Okay. So if you implement your own file system, okay, so you have to supply these methods. Okay. Typically an OS kernel will have support for a variety of different file systems. You may have support for let's say NTFS, a FAT file system, ext 3 file system, HFS, there are a whole bunch of them. Most general purpose kernels will have support for easily a dozen or more different file systems. Every file system is a module. If you remember the modular architecture for operating system kernels that we studied. The way you implement a file system is you create a module. Okay, if you have a device that needs that file system, you load that module okay, and that module recognizes how the file system is organized on disk and then the module itself implements all of these calls. So you have a file system specific implementation of open, read, write, all directory operations and so on. This clear? Okay. 
So right, I didn't show it similar to reads. There is a seek system call. Okay, the seek system call allows you to actually move the file pointer to a specified offset. Okay, typically, when you open a file, it's assumed that you open it for sequential reads. Okay, so let's say this is a file A. When you open it, that's the file pointer. It's pointing to byte zero. So if you read a few bytes, then the file pointer advances and so on. Okay, so but you are reading it sequentially. If you want to randomly read some data from a file, the only way to do this is you use seek and position your file pointer to the desired location of the file and then you read from that point. This is what seek would do. If you have done any random I.O., you will know that you have to first seek before you can read or write. This is how I.O. works in a file system. Yeah, so sequential reads, you never move the file offset. It's moved automatically for you every time you read or write. But if you are actually doing random IO to the file, you will use seek. Okay. The other interesting system call is memory mapping. Okay. If you remember many, many lectures ago, we used uh, encountered a, uh, a system called, called MMAP, okay, which as I said is a memory mapping of a file. Okay. If you remember what I said, what MMAP does is it takes a file from disk and it maps it to a memory address space of a process. Okay, so, so let's say that's your disk. It's a file on disk. This is a process. So if you mmap a file, okay, that's a system call okay, that's shown there. What will happen is this file will get mapped to a memory region of the process. Once you have mmapped the file, reads or writes to that file are actually handled as through simple reads and writes through memory. Okay, this just becomes a region of memory. Think of it as an array of characters. So you can simply try to read, let's say this. So an array file and if you simply read or write the ith location what will happen is the os will translate that automatically to a read or write to the ith byte of the file okay you are not explicitly using reads or writes at this point to disk you are simply using you are mapping the file to memory region and simply reading or writing that memory region it is almost as if a copy of the file has been brought to memory and stored here and this is actually done on demand. You simply go and access some region here, and if it's not already read, the OS will go read it and bring it in. Okay, just as you remember when we did demand paging, pages are fetched on demand. MMAP does something similar. It fetches chunks of or blocks of the file on demand into the memory map region. Okay. So you don't have to do reads or writes at this point on. You are essentially just reading or writing to memory region which is simply you access a memory pointer and you just read or write to that location. Okay. And all of those reads and writes are internally translated to real reads and writes to disks by the OS. So it's a convenient system call that is actually simplifies file operations. You just do MMAP and then you simply uh, access this memory region as if a copy of the file has been brought to your memory. Is that clear? Any questions here? Okay, so we are going to now talk a little bit about file access methods. So typically when you open a file, okay, there are two ways in which you can actually read or write data. Okay, the simplest is sequential. Sequential just says you open the file and you read it from the beginning to the end. Okay. Maybe in some number, some number of operations. You don't have to read it all at once. If you are opening the file in an editor, you will read the whole file. But if you are opening it for some other purposes, you may read, let's say, one block or one byte or some amount, and then you read the next chunk and so on. Okay. So basically, in sequential access, data is processed in order, one byte at a time. Okay. And that's a very common way of accessing a file. Compilers, editors, they all use sequential access. The other way to access a file is called keyed access. In a keyed access, you can actually go and access some random chunk in that file, okay? not necessarily sequential. Let's say one operation accesses some location, the next operation will access some other random location, not the next location. 
Okay. And this is based, typically what happens is you specify a key and that maps it onto location in the file. Programs that use this kind of access are databases, hash tables, dictionaries. Okay. Think of a file that is a hash table on this. If you hash a key, you'll go and read some hashed value from that file. That may be at some arbitrary location. You hash the next key, it will map onto some other value at some other location. So if you look at how the hash table accesses are translating to IO accesses, you will see that different IO accesses access arbitrary regions of the file. They are not necessarily sequential. This is referred to as keyed access. Okay. Two very different forms of access. Okay. Keep this in mind because we are going to soon start looking at how file systems are created and uh, how do they organize themselves on disk and this is going to be very important. We will see how are they optimized for both sequential as well as keyed access. So these two access patterns simply map onto sequential and random access. Okay, keyed access is essentially random access which means that any block of the file can be directly accessed. Okay, sequential is you just read from beginning to end. Random says I said give me block I and you go and access that block. We will want to come up with file system implementations that are going to efficient uh, eff or give you efficient access to a file regardless of whether it's sequential or random. <coughs> we will see uh, structures where one is better than the other for instance. Okay, so we'll talk about directories first before we go and talk about file system uh, implementations. Okay, so you know what a directory is. A directory or a folder is essentially a collection of files that users group together for whatever their own convenience. Okay, so you may say lab1 and put all the files of lab1 in the directory. Okay, internally a directory is simply a table. Okay, a directory is a special file that is simply a table. Okay, what does this table have? The table essentially has the file name. And it has the file ID. So you can say lab1.java and this will be some number. So lab2.java that will be a number. Okay. So all that your directory is, is a table that says this file, this directory has these files and if you open any of those files that is the ID of the file that you go and access. So every directory is a table of this. Directories can have other directories, of course. So, so you may have a subdirectory, and that will be a, a number that corresponds to that file. Okay. And that file is itself, in this case, a table. Okay. These may be actual files that contain data. Okay. Directories, other directories are files that simply contain this table. Okay. So I'll just show you an example. So if you actually do ls minus i, which is a command, ls is just file listing, you will actually see the, the name of the file and the id of the file, a number shows up. So this is essentially a, simply a print out of this table. Okay, so it shows you for every, in this case they are mostly directories, but for every file it will show you what is the id of the file. Okay, that is essentially that table that I just showed. And internally that is the number for the name, named object. Okay, so internally the OS is simply dealing with uh, in, uh, integer ID for a file or a directory and users actually think of them in terms of names that are given. Okay, so you can have single level directory, multi level directories. Most operating systems allow you to create any arbitrary level of nesting. Okay, so you essentially have a files hierarchy, a file system hierarchy of files. So you start with the root directory. I'm just talking about Unix, similar concepts are true in any operating system. So that's a root directory slash, you may have slash user, slash home, user may have local, slash pin, pin, and so on. And then there are files here. So you may 
commands, here are your user files and so on. User one, user two, and so this is own directory for you. So if you look at how files are mapped out, you essentially get a tree-like structure. It's actually, technically it's a directed acyclic graph. It's not a pure tree, as we'll see in just a moment. But you get a, a structure of this form. It's a hierarchical structure. Okay, you start with the root directory and you're going to have arbitrary level of nesting depending on how many directories you have along any path. So when you open a file, typically you're going to give an entire file name. Okay, you say slash, you say slash user local bin some command. What the OS is going to do is it's going to start at slash and then say is there a file directory called user? You go open user and then say is there a directory called local in that user? That directory go lo local, and then say, Is there a command or file called ls? Then you go and open that file. So you are going to actually do, re do recursively descend down the tree until you hit the file you want. Okay. Every time you open a file, you have to go through this process. Okay. This is called uh, sort of re re recursive dereferencing of the file name. Okay. So you are going to descend down this directory structure to figure out which file it is that you are trying to access. Okay, so I just mentioned this. So, uh, so this is the example I was just giving. User local bin. Next, okay, we are going to start at u slash, look for user. Then in open user, go look for local. Open that, look for bin, and then go look for a particular command, if you will. Okay, so the open method I had showed you will actually perform these operations. I did not show you all of those operations there. But first you have to do all of this. Once you find this, then you open the file descriptor for that file. And then say, what, what's the, who's the owner? Do you have the right permissions? And so on and so forth. Okay, so that's all we have for directories. I'm going to talk a little bit about referential naming uh, within files. Here, so typically a file has one name. Any file in your system is going to have one name. There are many special cases where you can give two names to a file okay, or any number of names. It doesn't have to be two, but a file can actually have more than one name. Okay. The way you do this is using this thing, uh, uh, feature called referential name. Okay. In Unix, these are called hard links and soft links. Okay. In uh, Windows and Mac, they are called shortcuts or aliases. Okay. If you have heard of any of these terms, you know what I am talking about. Okay. If not, then just follow along and you will understand what we do. Okay. So referential naming is a way to give multiple names to the same file. Okay. You can give arbitrary names and then you can open the file using either of those names. Okay. So it's probably it's a con interesting concept as to why you want to give two names but keep that aside for now. Let's see how it is done. Okay. So hard link basically is uh, going to create a second name and the way this is simply done in Unix is let's say you have file A and you want to give it another name B, you essentially say ln A B, which is ln is a sort of a short form for link. Okay, now both of those will have that file that you have will have two names, and you can open it using either of those two names. Okay. So what happens if you have two names is if you try to delete, let's say A, because the file has two names, you can't actually delete the file. All you can do is delete the file descriptor for the file, but because there is a file B that also points to the same file, you are not allowed to delete it. Okay, you simply remove this entry, that file will still exist, but you can now only access it with the second name, which is B. Okay. If you now go and delete B as well, then you are going to remove the file itself. Okay. And this, the reason, uh, the, this is the reason you have to keep a ref count with the file descriptor, which says how many names does this file have? If this has more than one name and the user deletes one of those names, okay, you don't delete the file itself because the file can still be accessed through some other names. If all the files with the uh, with point to this, uh, all the names rather that point to this files are deleted, only then do you go and delete the file itself. Okay, is that clear? Has anybody used links, hard links? Yes. Okay, good. I'll show you what to do. Okay, the one thing I should mention is uh, hard links, Unix doesn't allow you to give directories multiple names. So only files can be given multiple names. Directories you do not allow 
a directory to have more than one names because if you do this, you will have loops in your file system. So here is an example where you created a directory f, but you gave it a name that goes and points back to d. So this has created a loop. If you have cycles in your uh, file system, that causes lots of problems for many programs. Okay, let's say you are doing backup. You are trying to backup this directory. Okay, you will say, okay, let's backup D. You go open D, backup this file E. Say, now let's backup F. F points back to D. Okay, you will say, now I am going to, so you are going to st be stuck in a cycle here. Okay, so many programs are going to just go haywire if you have cycles in your directory stuff. So, you can give files multiple names using hard links, but you cannot give directories multiple names using hard links. There's another method to give a directory multiple names, but not this one. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example again. Okay, so let's make a directory here first. Okay. So I'm going to create a file. I'll give it name A. So that's file A. Okay, so I just created a file called A. It has that ID and I just put in some words in it. Now we'll give it another name. So we do this ln A B. So that says now you created a second file B which is now pointing to the same file. Okay, so you'll see your directory now has two files A and B. Okay, if you actually look at what they point to you will see that there are two names they point to the same file and the id is the same so what you simply created is this directory table where a, there are a and b but they are pointing to the same object internally okay, you didn't actually create two files you just created two names for the same file so regardless of whether you open it with this name or that name internally you are going to go and open this file which is the same internal object okay, so in fact if you just try to read what is in b you will see that it is basically going to read the same words that you put in A because it is pointing to the same file. Okay. So now you can go and remove one. Let's say, let's say remove the first one. Okay. B still exists. So this is what I was talking about. So you haven't actually deleted the contents because there are two names for the files. So you removed A. But if you went and deleted the underlying file, then you, if you try to open B, the file would be inaccessible. So what has happened internally is there is a reference count for this file that says that how many names does it have. As you delete each name, that, that counter is decremented. And only if it hits 0 are you actually allowed to delete the file. In this case, it went from 2 to 1. So you don't actually delete the underlying content. If you now delete B, you will see that the file is gone. There is no way to access it anymore. Yes. So if you want to access file A now, it would be A. Yes, file A is gone. Contents of the file A are still accessible using this other name B. Okay, so if you see that the B is still there, so whatever you wrote to A is still accessible. But you cannot open A because you just removed it. Right? So you just deleted it. But because B is still pointing to the same whatever underlying data, you can open B and that data is still intact. Questions here? Okay, so if now you delete B, then it's obviously everything is gone. Now we can just create A again, but make it a directory. Okay, now A is a directory. And now if you try to do this, you will get an error. So you cannot give, this is a directory, you cannot give it a different name. As I said that you are, you don't want cycles in the graph. So anytime you try to create a link to a directory, your system is going to say, sorry, you cannot do that, not allowed. Okay, exactly what I said on the slides. Okay, so no hard links to directories, but you can create, and you can give as many names you want to your file. They don't even have to be in the same directory. In this case, A and B were in the same directory, they don't have to be. Okay, you can make, give them whatever names and stick them in different directories. And whenever you open those files, you will basically go to the same underlying contents. Okay. So the other form of referential naming is what are called soft links, you know, shortcuts as you may have sort of seen them in Windows or 
some other operating system. So in this case, you are simply, you, you do give two names to the same file, but both the names don't actually point to the same file. One name points to the other name rather than both pointing to the same file. So here is the example. You have file A, which is pointing to file number 100 in your OS. If you do ln, should have been ln minus s here. Okay, so if you do ln minus s, which is a soft link, what happens is A is still pointing to file 100. But for B, you simply put a pointer to A, saying if you're trying to open B, go open A instead. That's all it is saying. Okay, look at the difference between the two to understand what's happening. You create hard links, both A and B are actually pointing to file 100. If you create a soft link, okay, A is pointing to 100, B is pointing to A. What that means is internally, if you try to open B, there is a, it's like a forwarding address. Okay, it says, if you want to open B, go look up A instead. So the OS will open this file and say, if I, the user wants to access B, I should actually go and try to access A, and then you go and access it. Is that clear? So this is referred to as a soft link and we'll see what the differences are. Now as far as soft links are concerned, you can create soft links for directories. Okay, so you can give two names to the same directory using a soft link. That is allowed okay, because it doesn't actually create a cycle because this is not pointing to that object. It's a forwarding address. So backup programs, for instance, can simply ignore any forwarding. They don't have to resolve it. Okay, but if something is actually pointing to a data object, you have to do something about it. As a forwarding address, you can ignore it. Okay, so soft links are allowed for directories. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pros and cons. Why would you want hard links or soft links or why have two mechanisms? Why not only have one? Anybody use aliases? I'm sure you use shortcuts. So what, do you know of any disadvantage or any problem of using hard links versus short, soft links? Yes. <coughs> so you're saying in a soft link, if you modify one, the other won't be modified, is that what you just said? Okay, so that is not quite true because in this case, if you actually modify this file and you try to open B, B is simply pointing back to A, so you will go and still open A. So you will get to the same modified contents. Okay, so yes, when you modify, you're still modifying the underlying object and the other one is simply pointing you there. It is not pointing directly, it's saying it's having one level of indirection. Okay, so the, the real difference comes here when you try to delete something. When you open it or modify it, they are roughly identical. They don't actually differ in their behavior. But when you delete it, you will actually have problems. So in this case, if you go and delete A, okay, B is still going to exist like we, uh, previously. But now if you try to open B, B is pointing to A. And A is gone, you just deleted it. So you'll get an error. If you have clicked on an alias and said, or a shortcut and said missing shortcut, what happened is the shortcut was pointing to a file, but then some user went and deleted the underlying file. So now the forwarding address is still there, but what is pointing to is gone. This wouldn't happen if you had hard link because in this case, B was not pointing to A, but B was pointing to the underlying object. So if you just remove this, this association was still there so you could open B and it was completely valid operation. In this case, if you actually uh, delete A, then you are going to have a problem. Okay, you can do the same experiment that I was showing you. I can in fact show you here. Let's, see. Let's clear everything. Okay, so we have an empty directory, so we will so we created a and that's a file. 
okay, but we are going to create a soft link to it. So now we have So you will see that there is a file A, there is a soft link which is you will see that it's actually pointing to it. Okay, these are actually independent files. If you do ls minus i, you will see that there are different IDs. In a hard link, they actually are both pointing to the same object. This is an independent file. All that this file contains is a pointer saying if you open this, it says go look up A. That's all that is stored in this file. In hard link, they are pointing to the same thing, they have the same ID. Here they don't. You see, they have actually consecutive IDs. Okay. Now you can go and remove A. So first, before I remove A, you can see that if you open B, you will still get the contents of A, like before. Okay. Because B is pointing to A, you go open B, you forward it to A, you go open A, you read it, you get the same content. Okay. So that part is uh, no different. But now, if you actually go and remove A, you still have B which is pointing to A. Now if you try to open B, you are going to get an error. So because it's going to try to open this and then the OS is going to be told, go look for A. Try to look for A, it's gone. Okay, so you get an error saying no such file on directory. This is the same thing that happens when you get a missing shortcut or a missing alias problem. Okay, because that's a soft name, soft pointer. If the underlying object is gone, you still the pointer is still there and you'll get an error. Okay, so those are soft links and hard links. The only advantage here, as I said, is that you can use soft link for directories. You can give a directory two names by making a soft link. Hard links are not allowed. Yeah, because soft links are not going to cause cycles. They are simply, as I said, forwarding addresses, so you can ignore them. You don't have to resolve them. If you resolve them, then you will see a cycle, but you don't have to. You can treat them in a special way. Any questions here? So directory operations, you probably know what you do in a directory. You can create a file in a directory, you can list a directory, and talk showed you ls, rename files, all of that things you do. Well, not much new here. We won't go into most of those details you just ignore them for this class i'm going to talk a little bit about protection instead okay. so <coughs> important aspect of the file system are protection attributes that you associate with files they tell you uh, or the os they tell the os what is the intent of the user in terms of who is able to access this files okay. typically protection information is stored using two different methods okay there is one called access control list or ACLS. This is the Windows way of storing protection information. For every file, there is a list maintained. In the file descriptor, there is an ACL list okay, which says who are the users and what operations can they do. So you may have user 1 can read, write this file. User 2 can only read this file. User 3 can write to this file. So this list is stored with every file. Okay. When you open the file, you go and look up this list saying who is the user who sent in this request. Is that user present in this list? If yes, what, what operation did the user ask for? Is it read or write? Do you have the permissions to do that? If yes, your operation will succeed. If no, it won't succeed. Okay. So every file is going to have this list. This list could be of arbitrary size. The users create this list. And by default, one is created for you, but you can modify it as you wish okay, and basically uh, add whatever entries you want and you can control sharing on a per user basis. So if you create, let's say, lab2.java, okay, you can create an ACL saying, give my user, my lab partner, read, write permission. So you can actually name your lab partner. So only you and your lab partner have access to that file. No one else does. This is how things would work if you had a file system that uses access control. What about if the user is not there? What if the user is not there? So question is, what if the user is not on the list? The user is not on the list and that user tries to open the file, you will get a permission error saying you do not have permissions to access the file. Okay. So this list is simply used to decide who gets to read or write a file. If a user tries to read or write to that file and that user is not on the list, 
you always won't let it or let that use. Okay, this is how you control sharing. Okay, that's the Windows way of doing things. Okay, you keep an access control list. Okay, the list can be arbitrary size. There's no restriction on how large this list could be. You can have thousand entries on that list if you wanted to give thousand users access to that uh, file, and then there will be a long list that the OS has to maintain. Or it could have only one entry, which is the common case where the user creates a file. He or she has access to it and no one else does. Okay, so most of the time hackers now only one entry, which is only the user has access to the file. But the list could be of arbitrary size. <coughs> okay. The Unix way is to basically have a very coarse grain version of the access control list. Okay, you don't have arbitrary size list, but you create all users that have access to the machine into three groups. Okay, then what are those groups? Anyone has used Unix? What are the file permissions on the file indicator? One. So basically, there are three bits, uh, three groups it's owner, something called group, something called void. All the users on your system are partitioned into three groups. Owner is you, the owner who created the file. And the, the owner of that uh, file belongs to a certain Unix group. Okay? That group could have more than one user as defined by the system administrator. So that's the group to which the file belongs to. So that's the group is same as the one that the owner belongs to typically. And world is everyone else. Okay? So you can specify what this, can this user do, the owner of the file can do on this file, what can other users that belong to the same group that this user belongs to can do on the file and what can everyone else do on the file. Okay. So essentially think of it as an access control list with three entries. Okay. So in Unix you can only have three entries. Okay. So what does the user do, what does the group do, what does the rest of the users which is world do. Okay. So if you have actually done ls minus l so we can so here is basically read write execute bits which says that i created that directory i have read write and execute access on that directory a the you know, the group has no permissions which is why there are all blanks or dashes there world has no permission that means only i have access so anyone else on this machine tries to access this directory, but the OS will say not allowed. Okay. So you can of course change these permissions using change mod. So if you can say change mod, you can do this and now the permissions would have changed. So I just allowed all users in uh, the group staff read and execute permissions and the rest of the world which is everyone else also read and execute permissions okay but not write so that basically says other users can look into that directory but they can't create files they can't delete files because there's no write permissions okay, so you can have these granular permissions but at a much more coarse grain so in windows you would actually have to list every user to which to whom you want to give access to in unix you essentially do this by specifying three permission, three groups of permissions: owners' permissions, user uh, group permissions, world permissions. Okay, so this is sort of the Unix way, which is, uh, and Unix does this mostly for efficiency because you just need nine bits. Okay, so the, internally, this string is stored as bits. One means that is allowed. Zero means not allowed. Okay, so one 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 means read, write, execute for the user. Okay, 101 says read, write, execute, read, no write, but execute for the group, and 000 is dash, dash, dash for the world, right? no one else can access. Okay. So you just need nine bits instead of an access control list that could be of arbitrary size. This is very compact. Okay, you just need nine bits to store this information. Any questions here? Anyone use this? I presume you have, right? And use per group file permissions before. 
So be careful when you give permission to your lab partner on Ed Lab, for instance. If you don't know this, you can inadvertently leave your directory open. And if you give world permission, that means anyone can come and take a look at what you're doing. Okay, so file permissions should be used carefully. We have had cases where people left their directory open, somebody else came, looked at the code, used that and got caught for academic dishonesty. And then we had to figure out how did the code go from one group to another. And the problem was they left the directory open. Okay, so if you don't set the right permissions, then you'll have problems like this. Okay, so I am going to now switch gears. We have 10 minutes. Let me talk about uh, file system implementation. Okay, so we talked about all the metadata, what are ownerships, what are protection information and so on. Now we will look at what does the file system do to actually store data itself, what kinds of policies it uses and so on. It's interesting. So to understand that, you need to first understand how a disk works. Okay. Only then can we understand how do you actually store data on this. Okay. So this is showing a simplified version of a disk. I brought two here. Okay. So that's really what a hard disk. If you pull out a hard disk from a PC, that's what it looks like. Okay. Now most of it actually is uh, inside. Okay. So if you've seen, you probably know what a CD or a DVD looks like. What your hard disk has is something similar. It has a DVD-like structure on which data is stored, except that in a hard disk, you will have a sort of a group of them stacked on one on top of another. Okay, DVD has only one surface on which you can read or write data. A hard disk, so this is, this is thick, it will have about eight of them stacked in here. Okay, so they're stacked one on top. Each surface allows you to do reads or writes. Okay, this is your traditional hard disk. Okay, it actually has these platters that spin and then you can read or write data. Okay. What I have here is sort of almost pointless to show this, it just looks like a box. So this is a solid state disk, okay. no moving parts. Okay. So this basically allows you to read or write just as you read or write memory. Okay. There's nothing moving here, you just address block I, you go to the IF location and you read. Okay. So these are what SSDs, uh, so if you have like a newer laptop, you may have this type of disk rather than these types of disks. These are traditional magnetic hard drives. Okay, so older disks, but all of the discussion we are going to uh, have at the moment relate to traditional disk drives, not solid state disks. So solid state disks require different kinds of file systems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about traditional disk drives. So here is a surface okay, uh, which looks like a CD. The way data is actually recorded is in concentric circles called tracks. Okay, so data is actually recorded in a circle. Okay, each, so you write basically each circle has bits written on it. So you have 1, 0, 1, 0 written on this. And then there is basically uh, each, so you have these concentric circles. Each of them is referred to as a track. Okay, you will see a track is chopped up into smaller pieces called sectors. Okay, a sector is the smallest unit of read or write on a disk. Even if you needed to write one byte, you have to minimally read the entire sector on which that byte resides. Okay. Typical sector sizes are 512 bytes on most disks. Okay. So the minimum amount of read or write you are going to do is 512 bytes at a time. Okay. So these are sectors or blocks. Those things are called tracks or cylinders. And the way the disk actually works is the disk, when you start it up, just as you, when you insert a CD, the disk starts spinning. Okay, so this thing is constantly spinning. There's a motor inside the disk that is spinning. And then there's a read-write head. Okay, that's actually going to read or write. So if you look at this disk, right, so if you start it up, there is a CD-like surface here. It'll start spinning. And there's going to be a read-write head that's going to basically position itself on top of some track there. And then whatever track it has positioned itself on, in this case is that track, that's the data it can read. You know, if you want to read data some, on some other track, you have to tell the disk head saying move to that track. Okay, so if you say move to track 10, it will basically move back until it's positioned on track 10. And then once it's on track 10, it can read or write data that's stored on track 10. Okay, so the disk head simply moves back and forth. Okay, and the disk itself is spinning all the time. 
Okay, the disk head won't spin. Disk head is positioned itself at some location. All it can do is go forward or backward. Okay, and by doing this, you can position yourself on any track. And once you're positioned on the right track, if you want a sector, you simply wait there until the sector spins by under the disk head. Once the sector is spinning by under the disk head, you can activate the head and read or write data. Is that clear? You need to understand this in order for us to understand anything about file systems, how they are designed. Okay, this is hardware level details. Okay, this is how magnetic disks work. Okay, now we'll understand. Once we understand this, we'll try to figure out what does this mean. So, so typical disk I/O operation. So the reason we we kept saying disks are slow. Okay, now we'll try to understand why they are slow. They are slow. So let's say you want to read a certain sector. Okay, let's say you want to read that sector. Okay. So the what you will tell the disk is go position the disk head on the track on which that sector belongs. That's this track, the second inner outermost track. So the disk head is going to move and position it somewhere. That may take some time. It may take a few milliseconds to move back and forth. Okay, so once you've gone and moved the disk head to the right track, and you say now read sector 10. Okay. Right, so each of these sectors are numbered. So this will be sector 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. You say read sector 10. So then the disk head has to wait there until sector 10 is going to spin by. And once it is right under the disk head, at that point you can start reading or writing data. Okay. So even after you have gone to the right track, you have to wait for the right sector to spin by under the disk head. That is going to take some more time. It may take another few milliseconds. Okay. Once both of those operations are finished, only then can you actually do some useful work which is reading or writing a set to a sector. Okay. So any disk I.O. operation has some overheads, which is first there is a latency to position the disk head at the right location. Okay, that latency has two parts. There's what's called the seek time. There's the time to move the disk head and put the disk head on the right track. And then there's called something called the rotational latency, which is the time for which the right sector, you wait for the sector to spin by and basically position itself under the head. Each of those operations will take typically a few milliseconds. It depends on where the disk head is. If the disk head is on the outer track and you make it move all the way to the inner track, there's going to be a long seek. You're going to go or move the disk head all the way. That's going to take more time. Likewise, if the sector you want has just spun by, you have to wait for the disk to spin completely and for that sector to come by. That's a big rotational latency. Okay. On an average, seek may be half the disk distance okay, from the innermost and outermost track. On an average, the rotational latency is half a spin, yeah, sometimes more and sometimes less. Okay. All of this is wasted time. Okay. Disk is not doing anything useful at this point. It's simply trying to position itself to the right location to read or write the data. So because of this, I.O. is slow because these are mechanical operations. Okay. So the disk is spinning typically, let's say, a few thousand rotations per minute. Okay. So it's going to spin pretty fast, but still, it will take a few milliseconds. And this head is can't be moved instantaneously to the player right location. You have to wait for it to go and position itself. Once you have done this, then you do reads and writes. Okay. So every disk I/O, every time you say read, you have to wait, incur a seek, you have to incur a rotational latency over it, and then something useful happens. So between two I/O operations, there's always some wasted over. And more the wasted less the throughput of your disk, less data you are going to read or write. So what we want is to uh, design file systems that is going that are going to store data in a way that is going to minimize this part of the I.O. operation. The less seeking you do, the less rotational latency you incur, the faster, uh, not the faster, but the more uh, higher is the throughput of the disk. Okay. So coming up with layout disk layout policies that minimize seek and rotational latency is an important goal for file system performance. The worse that is going to be, the worse performance you are going to see. We have run out of time today, but next time we are going to look at three different file system layout organisms, three implementations. We will compare them, we will see which ones are good and which ones are not. And we will use this to figure that.
So if you did not pick up your midterm or you had a makeup, yep, I have the midterms here, so you can come by and I'll handle them. Okay.